Part 4 of Lone Star Planet by H. Beam Piper and John J. McGuire. Read for you by Mark Douglas Nelson. This here LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 The next morning, which was Saturday, I put Thrombley in charge of the routine work of the embassy but first instructed him to answer all inquiries about me, with the statement, literally true, that I was too immersed in work of clearing up matters left unfinished, after the death of the former ambassador, for any social activities. Then I called the Hickok Ranch in the west end of Sam Houston Continent, mentioning an invitation the Colonel and his daughter had extended me, and told them I would be out to see them before noon that same day. With Hotty Ringo driving the car, I arrived about ten hundred, and was welcomed by Gail and her father, who had flown out the evening before, after the barbecue. Hotty, accompanied by a ranger and one of Hickok's ranch hands, all three disguised in shabby and grease-stained cast-offs borrowed at the ranch, and driving a dilapidated air-car from the ranch junkyard, were sent to visit the slum village of Bonneville. They spent all day there posing as a trio of range tramps out of favor with the law. I spent the day with Gail, flying over the range, visiting Hickok's herd camps and slaughtering crews. It was a pleasant day, and I managed to make it constructive as well. Because of their huge size, they ran to a live weight of around fifteen tons, and their uncertain disposition, super-cows are not really domesticated. Each rancher owned the herds on his own land, chiefly by virtue of constant watchfulness over them. There were always a couple of helicopters hovering over each herd, with fast fighter planes waiting on call, to come in and drop firebombs or stun bombs in front of them, if they showed a disposition to wander too far. Naturally, things of this size could not be shipped live to the market. They were butchered on the range, and the meat hauled out in big copter trucks. Slaughtering was dangerous and exciting work. It was done with medium tanks mounting fifty-millimeter guns, usually working at the rear of the herd. Although a super-cow herd could change directions almost in a second, and the killing tanks would then find themselves in front of a stampede. I saw several such incidents. Once, Gail and I had to dive in with our car and help turn such a stampede. We got back to the ranch house shortly before dinner. Gail went at once to change clothes. Colonel Hickok and I sat down together for a drink in his library, a beautiful room. I especially admired the walls, paneled in plastic-hardened super-cow leather. "'What do you think of our planet now, Mr. Silk?' Colonel Hickok asked. "'Well, Colonel, your final message to the State was part of the briefing I received,' I replied. "'I must say that I agree with your opinions, especially with your opinion of local political practices. Politics is nothing here if not exciting and exacting.' "'You don't understand it, though,' that was about half question and half statement. "'Particularly our custom of using politicians as clay pigeons.' Well, it is rather unusual. Yes. The dryness in his tone was a paragraph of comment on my understatement. And it's fundamental to our system of government. You were out all afternoon with Gale. You saw how we have to handle the super-cow herds. Well, it is upon the fact that every rancher must have at his disposal a powerful force of aircraft and armor easily convertible to military uses, that our political freedom rests. You see, our government is, in effect, an oligarchy of the big landowners and ranchers, who, in combination, have enough military power to overturn any planetary government overnight. And on the local level, it is a paternalistic feudalism. That's something that would have stood the hair of any twentieth-century liberal on end and it gives us the freest government anywhere in the galaxy. There were a number of occasions, much less frequent now than formerly, when coalitions of big ranches combined their strength and marched on the planetary government to protect their rights from government encroachment. 
This sort of thing could only be resorted to in defense of some inherent right, and never to infringe on the rights of others. Because in the latter case, other armed coalitions would have arisen, as they did once or twice during the first three decades of new Texan history, to resist. So the right of armed intervention by the people when the government invaded or threatened their rights became an acknowledged part of our political system. And, this arises as a natural consequence, you can't give a man with five hundred employees and a force of tanks and aircraft the right to resist the government, then at the same time deny that right to a man who has only his own pistol or machete. I notice the President and the other officials have themselves surrounded by guards to protect them from individual attack, I said. Why doesn't the government, as such, protect itself with an army and air force large enough to resist any possible coalition of big ranchers? Because we won't let the government get that strong, the colonel said forcefully. That's one of the basic premises. We have no standing army, only the new Texas Rangers, and the legislature won't authorize any standing army or appropriate funds to support one. Any member of the legislature who tried it would get what Austin Maverick got a couple weeks ago, or what Sam Saltkin got eight years ago when he proposed a law for the compulsory registration and licensing of firearms. The opposition to that tax scheme of Maverick's wasn't because of what it would cost the public in taxes, but from fear of what the government could do with the money after they got it. Keep a government poor and weak, and it's your servant. Let it get rich and powerful, and it's your master. We don't want any masters here on New Texas. But the president has a bodyguard, I noted. Casualty rate was too high, Hickok explained. Remember, the president's job is inherently impossible. He has to represent all the people. I thought that over, could see the illogical logic, but... How about your rancher oligarchy? He laughed. Son, if I started acting like a master around this ranch in the morning, they'd find my body in an irrigation ditch before sunset. Sure, if you have a real army, you can keep the men under your thumb. Use one regiment or division to put down mutiny in another. But when you have only five hundred men, all of whom know everybody else and all of them armed, you just act real considerate of them, if you want to keep on living. Then would you say that the opposition to annexation comes from the people who are afraid that if New Texas enters the Solar League, there will be League troops sent here, and this, this interesting system of ensuring government responsibility to the public would be brought to an end? Yes. If you can show the people of this planet that the League won't interfere with local political practices, you'll have a 99.95 per .95 percent majority in favor of annexation. We're too close to the Zisroff star cluster out here not to see the benefits of joining the Solar League. We left the Hickok Ranch on Sunday afternoon, and while Hottie guided our air car back to New Austin, I had a little time to revise some of my ideas about New Texas. That is, I had time to think during those few moments, when Hottie wasn't taking advantage of our diplomatic immunity, to invent new air-ground traffic laws. My thoughts alternated between the pleasure of remembering Gale's gay company and the gloom of understanding the complete implications of the Colonel's clarifying lectures. Against the background of his remarks, I could find myself appreciating the Gopal Klung Natalenko reasoning. The only way to cut the Gordian knot was to have another Solar League ambassador killed. And whenever I could escape thinking about the fact that the next ambassador to be the clay pigeon was me, I found myself wondering if I wanted the League to take over. Annexation, yes. New Texas customs would be protected under a treaty of annexation. But the justified conquest urged by Machiavelli, Jr., no. I was still struggling with the problem when we reached the embassy about 1700. Everyone was there, including Stonehenge, who had returned two hours earlier with the good news that the fleet had moved into position only sixty light minutes off Capella 4. 
I had reached the point in my thinking where I had decided it was useless to keep Hoddy and Stonehenge apart, except as an exercise in mental agility. Inasmuch as my brain was already weightlifting, swinging from a flying trapeze to elusive flying rings, while doing triple somersaults and at the same time juggling seven Indian clubs, I skipped the whole matter. But I'm fairly certain that it was until then that Hottie had a chance to deliver his letter of credence to Stonehenge. After dinner, we gathered in my office for our coffee and a final conference before the opening of the trial the next morning. Stonehenge spoke first, looking around the table at everyone except me. No matter what happens, we have the fleet within call. Sir Rodney's been active picking up those Zisroff meteor mining boats. They no longer have a tight screen around the system. We do. I don't think that anyone, except us, knows that the fleet's where it is. No matter what happens, I thought glumly, and the phrase explained why he hadn't been able to look at me. "'Well, boss, I gave you my end of it coming in,' Hottie said. "'Want me to go over it again? All right. In Bonneville we found half a dozen people who could swear that Kettle-Belly Sam Bonney was making preparation to protect those three brothers an hour before Ambassador Cumshaw was shot. The whole town soar than hell at Kettle-Belly for antagonizing the Hickok outfit and getting the place shot up the way it was and we have witnesses that Kettlebelly was in some kind of deal with the Zasroff, too. The rangers gathered up eight of them, who can swear to the preparations and to the fact that Kettlebelly had Zasroff visitors on different occasions before the shooting. "'That's what we want,' Stonehenge said. "'Something that'll connect this murder with the Zasroff. "'Well, wait till you hear what I've got,' Paris told him. In the first place, we traced the gun and the air car. The Bonnie brothers bought them both from Zasroff merchants, for ridiculously nominal prices. The merchant who sold the air car is normally in the dry goods business, and the one who sold the auto rifle runs a toy shop. In their whole lives, those three boys never had enough money among them to pay the list price of the gun, let alone the car. That is, not until a week before the murder. They got prosperous all of a sudden, I asked. Yes, two weeks before the shooting, Kettle Belly Sam's bank account got a sudden transfusion. Some anonymous benefactor deposited 250,000 pesos, about a hundred thousand dollars, to his credit. He drew out seventy-five thousand of it, and some of the money turned up again in the hands of Switchblade and Jack High and Turkey Buzzard. Then, a week before you landed here, he got another hundred thousand from the same anonymous source, and he drew out twenty thousand of that. We think that was the money that went to pay for the attempted knife job on Hutchinson. Two days before the barbecue, the waiter deposited a thousand at the New Austin Packers and Shippers Trust. "'Can you get that introduced as evidence at the trial?' I asked. "'Sure. Kettlebelly banks at a town called Crooked Creek, about forty miles from Bonneville. We have witnesses from the bank. I also got the dope on the line the Bonnie brothers are going to take at the trial. They have a lawyer, Clement A. Sidney, a member of what passes for the Socialist Party on this planet. The defense will take the line of full denial of everything. The Bonnies are just three poor but honest boys who are being framed by the corrupt tools of the big ranching interests." Hoddy made an impolite noise. "'What do we got to worry about, then?' he demanded. "'They're a cinch for conviction.' "'I agree with that,' Stonehenge said. "'If they tried to base their defense on political conviction and opposition by the Solar League, they might have a chance. This way, they haven't. All right, gentlemen, I said. I take it that we're agreed that we must all follow a single line of policy and not work at cross purposes to each other. They all agreed to that instantly, but with a questioning note in their voices. Well, then, I trust you all realize that we cannot, under any circumstances, allow those three brothers to be convicted in this court, I added. There was a moment of startled silence, 
while Hadi and Stonehenge and Peros and Thrombley were understanding what they had just heard. Then Stonehenge cleared his throat and said, Mr. Ambassador, I'm sure that you have some excellent reasons for that remarkable statement, but I must say, it was a really colossal error on somebody's part, I said, that this case was allowed to get to the court of political justice. It never should have, and if we take part in the prosecution, or allow those men to be convicted, we will establish a precedent to support the principle that a foreign ambassador is, on this planet, defined as a practicing local politician. I will invite you to digest that for a moment." A moment was all they needed. Thrombley was horrified and dithered incoherently. Stonehenge frowned and fidgeted with some papers in front of him. I could see several thoughts gathering behind his eyes, including, I was sure, a new view of his instructions from Klung. Even Hadi got at least part of it. Why, that means that anybody can bump off any diplomat he doesn't like, he began. That's only part of it, Mr. Ringo, Thromley told him. It also means that a diplomat, instead of being regarded as the representative of his own government, becomes, in effect, a functionary of the government of New Texas. Why, all sorts of complications could arise. It certainly would impair, shall we say, the principle of extraterritoriality of the embassies," Stonehenge picked it up. And it would practically destroy the principle of diplomatic immunity. My God! Hotty looked around nervously, as though he could already hear an army of New Texas Rangers, each with a warrant for Hotty Ringo, battering at the gates. We'll have to do something, Gomez, the secretary of the embassy, said. I don't know what. Stonehenge said. The obvious solution would be, of course, to bring charges against those Bonnie boys on simple first-degree murder, which would be tried in an ordinary criminal court. But it's too late for that now. We wouldn't have time to prevent their being arraigned in this political justice court, and once a defendant is brought into court on this planet, he cannot be brought into court again for the same act. Not the same crime, the same act. I had been thinking about this, and I was ready. Look, we must bring those Bonnie brothers to trial. It's the only effective way of demonstrating to the public the simple fact that Ambassador Cumshaw was murdered at the instigation of the Zasroff. We dare not allow them to be convicted in the court of political justice for the reasons already stated and to maintain the prestige of the Solar League, we dare not allow them to go unpunished. "'We can have it one way,' Paris said, "'and maybe we can have it two ways. But I'm damned if I can see how we can have it all three ways.' I wasn't surprised that he didn't see it. He hadn't the same urgency goading him which had forced me to find the answer. It wasn't an answer that I liked but I was in the position where I had no choice. "'Well, here's what we have to do, gentlemen,' I began, and from the respectful way they regarded me, from the attention they were giving my words, I got a sudden thrill of pride. For the first time since my scrambled arrival, I was really Ambassador Stephen Silk. CHAPTER Eight. A couple of New Texas Ranger tanks met the embassy car four blocks from the State House and convoyed us into the central plaza, where the barbecue had been held on the Friday afternoon that I had arrived on New Texas. There was almost as dense a crowd as the last time I had seen the place, but they were quieter, to the extent that there were no bands and no shooting, no cowbells or whistles. The barbecue pits were going again, however and hawkers were pushing or propelling their little wagons about, vending sandwiches. I saw a half a dozen big twenty-foot teleview screens, apparently wired from the courtroom. As soon as the embassy car and its escorting tanks reached the plaza, an ovation broke out. I was cheered, with the high-pitched yippee of new Texans, and adjured and implored not to let them so-and-sos get away with it. 
There was a veritable army of rangers on guard at the doors of the courtroom. The only spectators being admitted to the courtroom seemed to be the prominent citizens with enough pull to secure passes. Inside, some of the spectators' benches had been removed to clear the front of the room. In the cleared space, there was one bulky shape under a cloth cover that seemed to be the air car, and another cloth covered shape that looked like a fifty millimeter dual purpose gun. Smaller exhibits, including a twenty millimeter auto rifle, were piled on the friends of the court table. The prosecution table was already occupied. Colonel Hickok, who waved a greeting to me, three or four men who looked like well to do ranchers, and a delegation of lawyers. Samuel Goodham, Paris beside me whispered, indicating a big, heavy set man with white hair, dressed in a dark suit of the cut that had been fashionable on Terra seventy five years ago. Best criminal lawyer on the planet. Hickok must have hired him. There was quite a swarm at the center table, too. Some of them were ranchers, a couple in aggressively shabby work clothes, and there were several members of the diplomatic corps. I shook hands with them and gathered that they, like myself, were worried about the precedent that might be established by this trial. While I was introducing Hottie Ringo as my attaché extraordinary, which was no less than the truth, the defense party came in. There were only three lawyers, a little rodent-faced fellow whom Peros pointed out as Clement Sidney and two assistants. And, guarded by a ranger and a couple of court bailiffs, the three defendants, Switchblade Joe, Jack High Abe, and Turkey Buzzard Tom Bonney. There was probably a year or so age different from one to another, but they certainly had a common parentage. They all had pale eyes and narrow, loose-lipped faces. Subnormal and probably psychopathic, I thought. Jack High Abe had his left arm in a sling and his left shoulder in a plaster cast. The buzz of conversation among the spectators altered its tone subtly and took on a tone of hostility as they entered and seated themselves. The balcony seemed to be crowded with press representatives. Several telecast cameras and sound pickups had been rigged to cover the front of the room from various angles, a feature that had been missing from the trial I had seen with Gale on Friday. Then the judges entered from a door behind the bench, which must have opened from a passageway under the plaza and the court was called to order. The president judge was the same Nelson who had presided at the Waitley trial, and the first thing on the agenda seemed to be the selection of a new board of associate judges. Peros explained in a whisper that the board which had served on the previous trial would sit until that could be done. A slip of paper was drawn from a box and a name was called. A man sitting on one of the front rows of spectator seats got up and came forward. One of Sidney's assistants rummaged through a card file he had in front of him and handed a card to the chief of the defense. At once Sidney was on his feet. "'Challenge for cause!' he called out. "'This man is known to have declared, in conversation at the bar of the Silver Peso Saloon here in New Austin, that these three boys, my clients, ought all to be hanged higher than Haman. "'Yes, I said that,' the veneerman declared. "'I'll repeat it right here. All three of these murdering skunks ought to be hanged higher than—' "'Your honor!' Sidney almost screamed. "'If after hearing this man's brazen declaration of bigoted class hatred against my clients, he is allowed to sit on that bench—' Judge Nelson pounded with his gavel. "'You don't have to instruct me my judicial duties, counselor,' he said. "'The veneerman has obviously disqualified himself by giving evidence of prejudice. Next name.' The next man was challenged. He was a retired packing-house operator in New Austin, and had once expressed the opinion that Bonneville and everybody in it ought to be H-bombed off the face of New Texas. This Sidney seemed to have gotten the name of everybody likely to be called for court duty and had something on each one of them, because he went on like that all morning. "'You know what I think,' Stonehenge whispered to me, leaning over behind Peros. "'I think he's just stalling to keep the court in session until the Zasroff fleet gets here. 
I wish we could get hold of one of those wristwatches. I can get you one before evening, Hottie offered, if you don't care what happens to the mutt what's wearing it. Better not, I decided. Might tip them off to what we suspect. And we don't really need one. Sir Rodney will have patrols out far enough to get warning in time. We took an hour at noon for lunch, and then it began again. By 1647, fifteen minutes before court should have adjourned, Judge Nelson ordered the bailiff to turn the clocks back to 1300. The clock was turned back again when it reached 1645. By this time, Clement Sidney was probably the most unpopular man on New Texas. Finally, Colonel Andrew J. Hickok rose to his feet. "'Your Honor, the present court is not obliged to retire from the bench until another court has been chosen, as they are now sitting as a court in being. I propose that the trial begin with the present court on the bench.' Sidney began yelling protests. Hottie Ringo pulled his neckerchief around under his left ear and held the ends above his head. Nana Debadian, the ambassador from Beta Cephas IV, drew his biggest knife and began trying the edge on a sheet of paper. "'Well, Your Honor, I certainly do not wish to act in an obstructionist manner. The defense agrees to accept the present court,' Sidney decided. "'Prosecution agrees to accept the present court,' Goodham parroted. "'The present court will continue on the bench to try the case of the friends of Silas Cumshaw, deceased, versus Switchblade Joe Bonney, Jack Ha A. Bonney, Turkey Buzzard Tom Bonney et al.'s,' Judge Nelson rapped with his gavel. "'Court is herewith adjourned until 0900 tomorrow.'" End of Chapter 8